Well, brothers and sisters, this is the continuation of the message that I delivered Friday night. The two anointings. And I just want to thank the Lord for the response. I have spoken many, many times over the years. And some of the responses to the messages that I have brought, those that the Lord has given me, have been remarkable. And I am profoundly grateful. I remember uh, one of the conferences in which I spoke, there were spontaneous baptisms. And I talked about that in the book Insurgents in the very beginning. But I have never seen a reaction to a message that I have delivered that trumped the one Friday night. And I want to commend Brother Matthew for being sensitive to the Spirit. Of those of you who were there, it lasted at least an hour. And there was no music. And I praise the Lord for that. And I promised that I would deliver the second part of that message. And so that's what this is. Friday morning, as you remember, I talked about living in the conscious presence of God. And we looked at four different marks of the witness of God, of being in his presence. And one of them was affirmation, which is not relegated to, but includes what we call coincidence. And I exhorted you to keep your eyes open. Be aware of the coincidences that happen in your life, because oftentimes... If you are walking with him, those coincidences are affirmations and they have the fingerprints of God all over them. When I flew in to Little Rock for the conference, Matthew was supposed to pick me up, but there was a last minute change. And the brother who picked me up had a tattoo on his left arm. Now, I do not pay attention to tattoos on people, but I couldn't avoid this one because I was sitting in the passenger seat as he drove me to the cabin from the airport and his left arm was on the steering wheel, extended. And right there on his forearm, there was a tattoo that said Psalm 46. And that was the passage that I selected at the last minute to be our main text for the mastermind that I had with the leaders Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Psalm 46. (laughs) So right in the beginning of the trip to attend the conference and the mastermind was an affirmation from the Lord. And ever since 2019, I have been keeping a journal of affirmations, whether it's word of knowledge, whether it's word spoken that confirmed what the Lord was doing at the moment through people who weren't even aware of it. And then, of course, the many coincidences. Such things are not coincidences, so to speak, if you're walking with the Lord. God is highlighting something. He is either affirming his leading or he is getting your attention. He is highlighting something specific. And... All of the four ways that I discussed can be put under the rubric seeking the Lord. And we have an awful lot in the scripture about seeking the Lord, the exhortation to seek the Lord. Psalm 105 verse 4, seek the Lord and his power, seek his presence continually. And the word presence, very interestingly, in Hebrew is most often translated face, F-A-C-E, which indicates a close, intimate encounter with the Lord. So to seek the Lord's face, and that's repeated often in the Old Testament, is the Hebraic way of saying, pursue the Lord. Seek his face, seek his presence, live in his presence, pursue him. To seek the Lord, then, is to set your mind on him. And we looked at many passages in the New Testament that had to do with putting your mind, putting your thoughts on the Lord. And that is one of the ways in which we live in his conscious presence. And one of the questions that 
comes up, you may have had it yourself, is why does God ask us to seek his face? Why does he invite us to seek his presence? Why doesn't he just show up all the time in a vivid, undeniable way? But instead, we are to diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. I think the best answer that I've ever heard on this came from Dallas Willard. And he said something to the effect that God invites us to seek him because he wants to be wanted. He wants to be pursued. He wants to be chased. Those are my own words. We are made in the image of God. And as human beings, we want to be sought out, chased, pursued by the objects of our love. There is a part of God that beats as the bridegroom, and he wants to be chased by his bride. This is all over the book of Solomon, Song of Solomon, which is a picture of the monarch and the maiden, the king and his lovely bride. And I also talked about, in that same message Friday morning, the ability of God. And I used as an example of my own life some of the books I have written, the messages I brought, gosh, Friday morning's message and Friday night's message especially, are an example of what I was talking about. To be able to do things that exceed our natural ability, talents, and gifts. The ability or power of God. This is interesting because it doesn't mean that we have no part to play in it. If you are writing a book, for example, or an article, or even an email, in one sense it's very human. You have to think, you have to research, you have to craft your sentences. But the ability of God to articulate is part of that process. The strength of God, the power of God, a power that stands behind the words, whether you are writing or you're speaking, there is an energy that is coming through what is spoken or written. That is the power of the Spirit of God. But again, you have a part to play. And I love this passage out of Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 29, where Paul says, I work and struggle so hard. All right, just pause there. (laughs) Paul is saying, I work, I struggle. Then he continues. I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works in me. So Paul has a part to play. He is making effort. He's laboring, but he's not sweating because it is the power of God who is working through him. Another translation says, to this end, I also labor, striving with all his energy, working powerfully within me. So Paul is laboring, Paul is striving, but the source is the energy of God working powerfully through me. And this gets down to the business of prayer. (sighs) Now, there are different kinds of prayer, and I've talked about them in different places. There's fellowship, there's intercession, etc. But prayer in the sense of supplication or petition, where you are asking God in a position of fear and trembling, to grant you his power and his energy so that there will be eternal value in your service to him and enduring impact. That's the kind of prayer that I'm talking about. It's moving out of dependence on yourself and putting all your dependence on the Lord. In this way, prayer is God's power-sharing device. You see, the Lord wants to work with us and through us. This is why the New Testament, numerous times, states that we are co-workers with God, which is a marvelous thing, and it's an astounding thing that the God of the universe has called you and me to be his (laughs) co-workers in his service. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, For we are co-workers in God's service. At the end of Mark 16, The Lord was working with his disciples. In Acts 14, when Paul and Barnabas give their report of the first apostolic journey, their first 
kingdom community planting trip. They state how God worked through them. 1 Timothy 3 verse 2 in the ESV, which is a more accurate rendering, Paul writes about Timothy and he says, We sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker. Wow. (laughs) What a commendation. Timothy is God's co-worker. And this is the fruit of that faith and dependence on the Lord. Where we say, Lord, I cannot handle this. It's beyond me. I'm fearful of my own power and drawing on my own ability. I fully depend on you. If you are not going to show up, if you are not going to speak through me or write through me, then it's meaningless. It, in effect, is a waste of time and human energy. (laughs) So those are a few additions to the first message, living in the conscious presence of God. Now let's shift over to the two anointings. The Lord has used it to torch the religious life and service of many so far. And if you have not heard that message, I encourage you to do so. It's on the podcast, Christ is All. So is the first message, Friday morning, living in the conscious presence of God. And I specifically would love if you would share, particularly the second message, the two anointings, with every pastor, with every teacher, with every person who is in ministry of some kind, who you know personally. Now, In the last message, the two anointings, we talked about the difference between the anointing of King Saul and the anointing of King David. Both were anointed by the same prophet. Both were anointed with the same sacred olive oil. Both had the Spirit of God poured upon them, but the difference was in the container. Saul was anointed by a flask. David was anointed by a horn. And We said that the flask represents man's abilities, man's natural power and wisdom. A man created the flask, but God creates horns. He creates the sheep, the goat, and the horns that are on the top of their head. And I will say this, that in my studied judgment and in my sober observation, if I had a guess, 90% at least, of all who preach and teach today are ministering out of the energy of the flesh. It's the flask, not the horn. It's wool, not linen. It's brick, not stone. And that includes, brothers and sisters, take a deep breath, (laughs) many in the charismatic and Pentecostal movement as well. Even though a person can have the Spirit of God, they can harness the energy of the flesh in God's work rather than crucifying it. And I read out of 2 Corinthians 4, which again should be the go-to passage for every person who puts their hand to the plow of God's work. And in verses 10 and 11 of 2 Corinthians 4, here's my paraphrase. We endure the sufferings of the cross to break our natural power so that God's life may be released through us to you. And we are ministering not from the natural energy of the flesh, but from the life and the power of God. And the horn is a symbol that illustrates that principle. It speaks of life out of death. The animal from which the horn was used for the anointing oil was once alive. But when Samuel got a hold of the horn, the animal to which it belonged had died, but it contained the anointing oil, a symbol of the spirit of life. And so in that way, the horn was resurrected. And dear brothers and sisters, this is the secret to ministry that has eternal value and lasting impact, life out of death. And when I talk about God's power in this context, I am not speaking of his miraculous power to heal, to do signs and wonders and eat cucumbers, as a friend of mine used to put it. The miraculous power of God is real. I believe in it 100%. I've seen it. I've watched it. I've had the privilege of beholding the Lord use me as an instrument for the miraculous power of God at times. But the miraculous power of God does not transform the human heart. 
Jesus did many miracles during his short life on the planet. But most of the people who saw those miracles did not follow him and did not believe in him. In Luke 16, the Lord gave one of his parables. And in the parable, the statement, which is arresting, goes like this. If people won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. That statement came from the Lord himself. And if you remember when he fed the 5,000 with a few loaves and some fish, most of the people who watched that miracle and even participated in it by eating what he had created did not follow him afterwards. And the scripture is very clear. It says, because their hearts were hardened. Sisters and brothers, miraculous power is wonderful. But it doesn't transform the human heart. I have watched this all my life. As I said on Friday morning, I grew up in the Pentecostal and charismatic world. Spent many, many years in it. And I watched people behold authentic, genuine miracles. But it did not change them. When I'm talking about the power of God in this context, on the two anointings, I'm talking about the power of God to penetrate the heart, the human spirit, produce repentance, give revelation, insight, turn the heart to where there is a real change. The kind of transformation that we see in John, the son of Zebedee. If you remember... <laughs> John, the apostle, along with his brother James, were called the sons of thunder. They wanted to rain fire down from heaven on a little village in Samaria because they didn't receive Jesus. They were intolerant. They were judgmental. But that same man, John, the son of thunder, was transformed by the Lord's power and presence into the apostle of love. That's the kind of transformation I'm talking about. Sisters and brothers, King Saul, Balaam, and Samson all wielded the miraculous power of God. But they all had serious character flaws that ended up destroying them. So when I talk about God's power related to the two anointings, I'm speaking of his energy to transform human hearts through preaching, teaching, exhorting, even through one-on-one -on -one shepherding in a way that reveals the Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing splendor, his jaw-dropping glory, his heart-pounding majesty, and his infinite irresistible beauty. It is Christ who changes the human heart. And a person who is operating out of the anointing of God to reveal him is doing just that, unveiling the Lord. And in the book, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, which I'm sure Matthew has talked about. Thank you, brother. I have a whole chapter on this and some of the other principles that I've been discussing in this conference. God uses broken vessels as instruments of his power and life. And as we discussed in the last message, that requires suffering. I want to read Romans 7, verse 6. And what I'm about to share are many of the things that belong in the message, the two anointings. This is the continuation. Romans 7, verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law. Keep that in mind. Delivered from the law. Having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I want to highlight that last phrase. Serving in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. F.F. F. Bruce, the great scholar, one of my favorite of all time, said, quote, For Paul... To be under the law is one way of being in the flesh. End of quote. I'm going to run that by again. For Paul, to be under the law is one way of being in the flesh. 
We talked about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's not only the tree of the knowledge of evil. It's not just that evil springs from that tree. The knowledge of good springs from that tree. And the desire to be good springs from that tree. And sisters and brothers, when God gave the law, that part of humanity, which is the desire to be a good person, and that's still in every human today, even if they turn out to be evil, and in one sense, all of us are evil, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Paul says in Romans. But there is that innate desire, I want to be a good person. And then God gives the law. And God's people tried to fulfill the law. They tried to obey the law. Why? Because they wanted to be good. But here's the problem. The human life, the natural life, the natural strength, all that we have in the flesh, what we are apart from God's life is flesh. And the flesh cannot fulfill the law. Listen to Romans 8. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Let me paraphrase that. No one can fulfill the law because of the flesh. The flesh is too weak. Even though there is the desire to do good, which Paul describes in Romans 7. But the flesh, what you are apart from God's life and power, is unable to fulfill God's law, God's will. And so we died to the law. We stopped trying in our own effort to be good. And this applies to Christians. It applies to God's people. It applies to those who have the Spirit. Instead, we walk in the Spirit. We follow the Spirit. We allow the Spirit to live through us. And those who walk in the Spirit, who live by the Spirit, who draw on the life and power of the Spirit, are those who fulfill the requirements of the law. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. You can think of it this way. The desire to do good is human. The ability to try to do good and fulfill God's law is the flesh trying in itself to be a good person and to please God. But the flesh cannot please God. This is all the knowledge of good. And it's the wrong tree. But the tree of life is goodness itself. You see, the tree of life shows us that good, being good, doing good is a life form. And that's why when someone said to Jesus, good teacher, good master, he said, no one is good except God. God, his life, his person, his energy is goodness. So I, as a Christian, can try to be good myself by striving and laboring and trying to put God's will, God's law into action. That's eating from the wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Or I can recognize that I cannot fulfill the law of God no matter how much energy I exert. Only Christ can fulfill the law through me. And so when I walk in the Spirit, I am living by a different life and the nature of that life is goodness. And the moral requirement of the law is fulfilled in us who walk by the Spirit. It brings us to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to look at a different passage. Galatians 3, verse 5. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit, the Spirit of God, to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? All right, so the Spirit of God is supplied to you, Paul is saying to the Galatians, by what? The works of the law? What are the works of the law? It's trying to be good in your own power. It's trying to fulfill God's law by your own natural energy. And the works of the law is not, as some scholars say, relegated to circumcision, the Sabbath, and the dietary laws. Galatians 5 very clearly says that if you're a Gentile and you receive circumcision, 
or you're a Jew and you were circumcised, and you believe that that's keeping the law, then you're sadly mistaken. If you're going to make circumcision or the Sabbath or keeping the dietary laws the requirement for fulfilling God's will, then you're a debtor to keep the entire law. That's Galatians 5 verse 3. So the works of the law applies to the entire law of God. It's you trying to obey God in your own power and your own strength. And then we have 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6. And this is all about ministry in the new covenant. Ministry by the spirit, not by the law, not by the flesh. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6. We are ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, meaning the letter of the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So you put all of that together and here's what you find. Here's what you discover. Quoting F.F. F. Bruce again, for Paul to be under the law is one way of being in the flesh. You can either serve God by trying to be good in your own natural power and energy, and that will never bear fruit because it's the flesh trying to fulfill the law of God. And the result is failure, spiritual weakness, no fruit. Or you can live, you can serve God by a different source, a life not your own, the indwelling life of Christ, which is in the spirit. You can serve in the energy of the spirit of God. And that has nothing to do with the law of God. Yet you are fulfilling the law of God, but it is not you, it is Christ. And that's the meaning of the horn versus the flask. So let's again go back to the differences between King Saul and King David, beginning with their anointings. In David, we have God's way of preparation and promotion. It works from the inward to the outward. If you remember, Saul represented the human desire for a king. He was man's choice, woman's choice. David was God's choice and God's desire. Saul was a king after the flesh, even though he was anointed and God used him in the beginning. David was a man after the spirit, even though he made mistakes and sinned at one point grievously. And I find this fascinating because in 1 Kings 4, when Solomon talks to the Lord about David, he said, David, my father was faithful he was honest, he served you faithfully, and never mentions the great sin of David through which Solomon came into existence. It's because of the forgiveness of God, brothers and sisters. And in Acts 13, when David is mentioned, there's no hint of his sin. He is the man after God's own heart who did all of God's will. And what a contrast between the way Christians treat other Christians when they have sinned or made a mistake. And God looks at it and says, I don't even remember it, but it's under the blood of my son. And just as I have done with this servant, whether it's David or anyone else, Peter, I have done with you. Repentance and faith in Christ and the receiving of his cleansing blood is part of the new covenant. And the Lord said, it's repeated in Hebrews, I will remember their sins no more. I will toss them as far as the east is from the west. And that's exactly what happened to David. And any brother or sister who's listening to this, who's blown it, who's fallen, who's sinned, and that's all of us. That's all of you who are hearing this, whether you minimize it or not. In God's eyes, falling short is falling short, period. You can still serve the Lord just as David did. So that's a word of hope and encouragement. For David, the process of promotion was very slow. For Saul, his promotion was immediate. David worked into having authority. Saul had authority instantly, and he did not walk in it. You have the difference between human authority, which is positional authority, and experiential authority, which is spiritual authority. And the way of man is to give a gifted person a naturally talented person or position 
then put them on a pedestal and hope they'll get experience. But that's not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom is you first are faithful to your father. You first kill a lion and a bear and lay your life down for the sheep. You first slay the giant that no one else will touch. I'm speaking now of David. There were many years between the time that David was anointed by Samuel to the time that David took the throne. There was a lot of preparation. And God gave David a lion and a bear to prove himself, and then a bigger lion and a bigger bear, which was Goliath. That tree of knowledge of good and evil represents independence. Independence from God's life and power, trying to do it on your own, even if it's a good thing, even if it's serving God, you are still living and serving independently, where the tree of life is full and complete dependence on God's life and God's power. Another big difference is that the anointing of God never left David, despite his flaws. But the anointing did leave Saul permanently. David inquired of the Lord before he made decisions. And that takes time. Saul did not inquire of the Lord. If you remember, he took the counsel of a witch and rebelled against his God. A horn grows until it reaches its time. Saul was promoted way too fast. And he ended up being damaged by the power that God bestowed on him. And didn't use that power. <laughs> He used his own flesh to serve God. And because he was in the flesh, he was jealous and threatened by others. He was so gripped by jealousy over David and so paranoid that David was going to take the throne. But David wanted to unseat Saul, which was something all in his head, that he wanted to kill, murder David to keep his kingdom. And he did murder the priests of God, the priests of the Lord. The flask, in some translations, is vile, V-I-A-L. A flask and a vial are the same. But here's the point when we look at Saul. The anointing in a vial can make a person vile, V-I-L-E. And Saul was certainly vile. He didn't start out that way, but he became that way. Left to our own devices, brothers and sisters, we all can become Saul's. If we are in the flesh and we draw from the flesh, that's where it can lead us. A person who is anointed by the vial or the flask can easily become vile if they continue in the energy of the flesh. The horn also speaks of enduring impact. A flask is going to deteriorate over time because it's made by a man. But horns endure long after the animal upon which it laid died. Consequently, the horn speaks of eternal value and the flask speaks of temporary value. And here it is, sisters and brothers, the source upon which you draw will determine what kind of impact your ministry is going to have. Don't be deceived by thinking that just because someone said great message or great sermon, or that was wonderful what you said, or that really blessed me. Don't be deceived into thinking that that is the equivalent of eternal value and enduring impact. It's not. Compliments, sisters and brothers, are not something you can go by. You can sacrifice and sweat for God, but if it is not energized by God's life and power, it will not bear lasting fruit. Philippians 3, verse 3, For we are the circumcision. We are the true circumcision. We are the true Israel of God, who worship God in the Spirit, not in the flesh. We serve Him in the Spirit. We serve Him in the Spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And he says, I might have confidence in the flesh because, in effect, I lived as a Pharisee in the flesh. And concerning zeal, I was head above all of my peers. Concerning obeying the law in my own power, I was blameless. At least when it came to the external part of the law. 
Now the internal, what the law really means, maybe you didn't commit murder, but if you hate someone, you've just broken that law. And Jesus shows us what the real meaning of the law is in Matthew 5 to 7. No confidence in the flesh. The self putting itself forward in the service of God, exerting its own strength. And Jesus says, if you will follow me, if you will serve me, he must deny himself. That's your natural energy, brothers and sisters. Your natural power, your natural strength. All that you are apart from God. And what this requires of all of us is a solemn act of surrender to deny our own power and strength, our own righteousness, our own goodness, an effort to be good, our own wisdom, and put all of our dependence and trust in the Spirit of God and His power and His life and His wisdom and His strength. What ministry really is, in effect, is the overflow of life, spiritual life. To say before you speak or before you help someone or before you serve in any way, before you write, Lord, I am in your hands. Please come forth. I rely on you and not myself. I am dependent fully on you. If you don't come through, if your life does not break through this earthen vessel, nothing will happen. And I talked to you about the importance of of suffering and how that plays into this. The cross and its breaking power and its transforming power. To live in the flames of suffering, to walk through the southeast corner of hell, to the very edge of life itself, and to come out on the other side in resurrection is the secret to ministering the Lord Jesus Christ in power. And God's power operating in it is not for our own personal enjoyment. That's not its purpose. It's for giving glory to the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, and watching people impacted by him in an unalterable way. But brokenness, emptiness, poverty of spirit are the keys to exercising that power. And I talked to you about the fact that in our suffering, when it comes to the cross coming into our life to transform us and break us, the devil is often at work if not all the time. Fallen humans are often at work, if not all the time. But behind it all is the sovereign, loving hand of God who has a higher purpose. We can see the same thing play out in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Who was responsible? Well, the devil was the one tempting Jesus, but who led him there? <laughs> the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Same principle. How about Paul's thorn in the flesh. The thorn was clearly satanic, but if you pull the curtain back, it was God who put the thorn in Paul's life. Let me read it. Therefore, Paul says, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. I was given. Who gave it? God the Father. A messenger of Satan, that's what the thorn was, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Why? Because God gave it to him. But he said to me, the Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And all throughout the New Testament, the power of God and weakness are linked together. And if I share more on this... <laughs> In future messages, I'll go through all those scriptures with you. Paul continues, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. He's talking about the work of the cross. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10. That's Paul's theology of suffering. God uses sufferings, trials, tribulations, afflictions in the lives of his people to form Christ into their character and to release the power of God through them. God's work done God's way 
by God's power will receive God's blessing in transforming human hearts. 1 Peter 4, verse 11. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, serves the Lord, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15.10 By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Talking about the other apostles. I, Paul, worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. You can translate that to say, I worked harder than them all, but it wasn't me that was working on my own. It was the power of God. You see, grace is not only unmerited favor, undeserved favor, it's also God's power to carry out what we ourselves cannot do. Grace is God's power to carry out what we ourselves cannot do. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, for the grace of God has appeared. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. See, grace is God's power as well as God's favor. So keep it in mind when reading 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. And again, all of this echoes Colossians 1.29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. I toil, I struggle, but it's his energy. <laughs> Notice the interplay between Paul and God's power. It's not just God's power, as if it levitates him and controls him and takes him over. It's Paul working, but doing so by God's energy. If I bring another message in the future. Remember I said Friday night that I wish I had 24 sessions. If I am invited by a conference host or a pastor uh, to deliver messages on serving by God's power, which is the theme that I've been speaking on, I'll talk about the fragrance and aroma of Christ ministering out of his life and power. And the result of that being a sweet aroma or fragrance or savor of Christ coming through us as we allow the cross to cut deeply in our life. That deep work of Christ in his cross so that his aroma can come through us. But I think at this point I'm going to end this message and put a bow on this thing as best I can and get practical. What are the signs of ministering by God's power versus human energy. In other words, how do you know if you're ministering out of God's life and not the energy of the flesh, not your own natural strength? And that's the question before the house. And here's my answer. If you are operating by the horn and not the flask, meaning you're serving by God's power in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter, the law, which is by the flesh. Here are some of the signs. First, the impact that you will have on the people you're serving, ministering to, will last longer in those who receive your message with open hearts. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I won't read it, but you can look there. Paul gives us an illustration of building with imperishables, gold, silver and precious stone versus building with wood, hay, and stubble. Building with wood, hay, and stubble, the natural energy will burn up. There's no lasting impact. But building with gold, silver, and precious stone, those are imperishable. They will not burn up when the fire comes. Secondly, the impact goes beyond the mind, the emotions, and the will of your listeners. It cuts straight to the heart or the spirit. And the result is spiritual transformation. 
something shifts, something happens deep inside them. It could be a revelation of Christ, an unveiling of Christ. It could be conviction over sin, which comes by the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. It could be repentance. It could be an altering of their life or even in their ministry in some way. Something dramatic happens. It goes beyond the human soul right down to the spirit. Another sign is your words flow like oil. Your articulation is beyond your natural ability. Another sign is there is a wisdom that unwittingly seeps out. It goes beyond your preparation. A wisdom that exceeds your own. And even you are surprised by it. Another is that there is a power or an energy that's coming through your words. Beyond the words, there is a detectable power that people can sense in the room. I remember uh, there have been times where I have shared messages and people have said something happened in that room that was beyond words. That's the power of God and we can awe at it and we can glorify Him through it. Another is that the people listening to you will have love for the Lord awakened in their hearts, which in turn will naturally overflow into love for God's people. Remember the nature of the Spirit, the nature of God's life is love. That's His nature. First John, God is love. That's the essence of His nature. And so when His power is operating, and it penetrates our hearts. It enters into us. The result is love for the Lord and love for his people. Another is you possess an energy beyond your own. You're not turning the crank. You're not trying to conjure up anything. It's beyond your effort. Whatever effort you put into your preparation, there is an energy that's not your own that comes through it. And when it's over, you cannot be sure how many people were impacted, but you have confidence that what you shared was beyond your natural capacity. And here's another thing. You're not exhausted until the task is finished. For example, you can minister under God's anointing and speak twice or three times in a day for an entire week without getting exhausted. The exhaustion, however, will come, but it will come after the mission is completed. But you won't be exasperated until it's finished. I'll give an example of this. In April of this year, I was in Orlando, Florida on a spiritual retreat that I was facilitating. And I was with a group of leaders and I spoke 15 times in four days. And I was not exhausted. I wasn't tired. I wasn't worn out. Where was the energy coming from? It was coming from a different source. Of life and power. Clearly it was the Lord's power. Now I am not a person who has natural stamina. I am incapable at this moment of running a mile. I get exhausted easily. But when I switch sources, I can minister for a long time without getting weary. Now after that four day retreat was over, I had to recharge because of what it does to the physical body and the emotions. But until the mission is complete, you will have an energy beyond your own natural capacity. Even the Lord Jesus had to recharge. But he only did so after a task was completed. And now for the million dollar question, how? How, Frank, do I begin serving in the energy of God's life and not in the energy of the flesh? How do I serve in linen and not wool? How do I labor with stone and not brick? How do I operate out of the horn, not the flask? Give me the handles. Well, I'll begin by saying that early in my Christian life, I looked for ways to work for God. Later in my life, I asked God to help me work for Him. And then finally, I learned to watch God work. So here are my practical pieces of advice. These are not steps, by the way. These are handles to make what you have heard in Friday night's message, the two anointings, and in this message, serving in the newness of the Spirit, a practical reality in your life. I guess first I'd say admit that you've been serving God in your own energy. Without that insight, 
you're not going to go beyond anything else. Confess it to the Lord and tell him you despise doing it anymore. Brothers and sisters, you had a model of this right in front of you after the Friday night message. And if you listen to the audio, you'll begin to hear the first part of it. And as I've shared before, one of the worst things in my own life has been to speak somewhere and you're left with your own natural resources. It's a horrible feeling. And as I said, I can only remember four times where that happened, but they have marked me so that any time I stand up to speak anywhere, I am in fear and trembling of my own natural power and ability. That Lord deliver me from relying on it. Secondly, ask God to begin ministering through you by his life and power. Brothers and sisters, that is a bold and daring prayer. And after you pray it, duck. Because the Lord, if he answers the prayer, is going to begin breaking you circumstances and situations are going to fall into your life, some of which are inexplicable, and it will be the cross of Jesus Christ coming into your life, the breaking hand of God. And following that, I would say, allow, permit his breaking in your life. Don't fight against it. Don't resist it. Don't blame other people. Don't blame God. Even the people who are in the your trial, who are wreaking havoc on your life. Don't blame them. Recognize that this is the Lord's loving hand designed to break you and transform you so that he can use you in his service. The vessel is being broken so that the treasure can be released. Keep that perspective, sisters and brothers, because if not, you can waste your suffering. And finally, before you speak again or write or whatever it is you do in the Lord's service, deny yourself and your natural abilities. Put no confidence in your flesh and in your natural strength. Fully and completely depend on your Lord and his power and trust it. Trust it. Ask other people to pray for you as well. I do this myself. Uh, before this conference, I asked a number of people, friends and family members, to lift me up to the Lord because I am so sensitive that I cannot draw from my own natural power. It has to be the Lord speaking through me, else it's a big waste of time and energy. And this is the essence of faith. Faith is expecting God to be and do that which you cannot do. It's expecting God to be and do that which you cannot do yourself. And so believe. Put yourself under the waterfall of God's Spirit. Get on your knees, get on your face, cry out to him for his power and his strength. Not so you will look good, but so he will be glorified and God's people will be touched. Get your mind off yourself as much as you can. Put your mind on the needs of God's people. Or if you're ministering to the lost, the needs of the unsaved and the glory of Jesus Christ, your Lord. I will close with words by Rick Warren. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. God is more interested in making your life holy than he is in making your life happy. And sisters and brothers, remember that when the cross comes into your life. Praise the Lord.